So let me welcome our next speaker, uh, Rick Wheeler, and he's going to talk about persistent memory. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. I hope you all can hear me. One thing, I usually give this talk in a much smaller room, so I love to have questions during the talk. I ask the specific troublemakers I know best to sit in front. But if you want to ask questions, raise your hand. Someone will find you with a mic. If you want to ask a lot of questions, sit up close. And also, if you want to throw things, the closer you are, the easier it is to hit me. So um, I'm going to start um, giving an overview of some new technologies. Anybody here work on file systems or storage? I know some, some guilty people. So I manage the kernel team at Red Hat that does file systems and storage. In total, we have about 45 mostly kernel engineers in my group. So my, my usual joke is, if you've ever lost your data on Linux, it's probably my fault, indirectly at least. Um, I know, our, you know the people who deal with our customers always yell at me when we do something bad, but we try to make it better. But again, you know, one of the things that makes file systems really difficult is we try to solve lots of problems for lots of people. Right? There's not just one workload or one use case or one type of storage. And historically, if you think about how storage has worked and file systems worked over decades, we've always tried to look at high throughput more than low latency. And the main reason you look for high throughput is storage devices are really, really slow. So if you want to write a small piece of data to a spinning SATA drive, it takes like 20 milliseconds or so. I mean, it's, it's really painfully slow. So a lot of applications Databases do batching of transactions. File systems do journaling and, and coalescing of I.O. The I.O. Uh, uh, scheduler tries to batch and coalesce requests. We try to avoid talking to storage just because it's so painfully slow that it's always better to wait, try to coalesce stuff, and then drive down a bigger I.O. request all in one go. Other things that we've always looked at, you know, and other things that push us in different directions are, are power, right? Spinning up a drive, like if your laptops are running today, the, the drive is probably spun down, right? You're, you're probably mostly writing to DRAM, and occasionally your drive will spin up. The um, other things you, you want to think about, and these are all kind of tensions when you're talking about file and storage, is getting fast for little small things or fast for giant things. Anybody here have a petabyte of file system? I know somebody does, yeah? One person has a petabyte, a couple. Most of us don't. Even most enterprise customers are a few terabytes. Right? But again, getting to run at scale is a much more of a challenge than running at uh, small systems. So this is my favorite slide. I didn't make it. I tried to make it. I have abysmal art skills, so I, I abandoned it and Googled around until I found this guy who drew a good representation of the Linux kernel stack. It's incredibly complex. Right? And going through all these layers, forget about what, the, what does what, is why we, we have a lot of latency in the stack. I mean, there's latency just from the code path and from the locking going down the stack. I don't know if I can point here. But if you look in this space, if you've had Fusion I.O. or Micron cards, they put their device drivers out there on the side to avoid part of the path. They cut off the bottom of the stack and have a, a, a little bit less contention, a little bit less code to go through. So we're going to start about going faster. Again, historically, bandwidth has been the measurement people go for. Great for backups. If you're watching movies, perfect. That's what you want to look for. Because you know, movies are laid out sequentially. You read them, gigabytes a second, megabytes a second. That's what you want. Also, a lot of the work at the high end with enterprise customers has been in very big storage arrays. I, I spent 10 years at EMC working on things like Symmetrics. Actually, five of those years I spent here uh, working with a group called Filepool in Belgium. So it was a lot of fun where I got to, to get through the first A through H letters of the Belgian beer alphabet with our releases. I have to finish the rest of the alphabet this weekend. Um, but again, like I said, you, we historically wanted to drive these big, high-speed, high-bandwidth devices. They actually had internally, like a high-end disk array from HP, IBM, Hitachi, EMC. They have effectively persistent memory. They have giant caches, uh, gigabytes and gigabytes of DRAM backed up by batteries or non-volatile memory technologies. They have had for 15 or 20 years, but you're still talking over SCSI or over fiber channel or over iSCSI, whatever. So life changed a few years ago when those annoying people brought out SSDs with flash. And at that time, there wasn't a single person in the file system community who wasn't asked, oh, now everything you've done needs to be thrown away. You're going to have to write a new stack and a new file system. And the truth was that the original SSDs, and probably a lot of anybody here have an SSD in their laptop? 
it does make life better, right? It hasn't changed your life completely. Mainly because they're really good at random reads, they're reasonably good at random writes, they're okay at bandwidth, right? And they also have, especially in the first generation, they, would, they had a tendency to die in unusual ways, right? So a lot of people got SSD devices and for the first lucky people who figured out how they would die for us, um, you know, it, it, they died in a different way than your drives died. Drives tend to drive, you know, kind of all at once or have very random errors, but they don't forget where all your data was, right, and still plug in. But SSDs had that issue, maybe a bit less now. But the nice thing about the uh, SSDs that were SAT or SAS form factor, they plugged into our existing stack. They used that whole stack, so all of our things like device mapper, file systems, everything worked pretty much without change. You might pick a different I.O. scheduler for a very high-speed SSD, but normally, you would plug it into your laptop, whether you're running Windows, Linux, Mac OS, it just works. So, not happy with inflicting a little bit of pain and discomfort, people cranked up the, the, the heat on us again by having PCI Express SSDs. These are the devices I mentioned before, Fusion IO, Micron, I don't, a, a bunch of vendors have them today. They have their own device driver off on the side, they cut out a big chunk of the Linux IO path, and they can do tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of IOs per second. All of a sudden, what we used to do isn't really fast enough. They typically started by ignoring SCSI and SATA commands altogether. So they just don't do it. They're just doing a block-based IO. But even with that, after a few years of pain and struggle, we managed to give you most of the value for those devices. We're pretty good at those now. I mean, we can, we can pretend that you, you got what you paid for. Um, again, you tend not to use the I.O. scheduler uh, when you have a high-speed uh, SSD, um, and, uh, but you still use your existing file system. But even these devices, as they get faster and faster, I don't know, Kent is here in, in Bcash, Yens and people have done a million I.O.s per second, I think, with, with RAM-based devices, but... We, Yeah, so the comment is from Kent, who, who's Mr. Bcash in the front row, that uh, Yen's Expo has gotten up to uh, about 2 million IOs per second with uh, Micron SSDs in a big no, machine. Uh, 13 million, in, 13 in, million. A, in a single box with a bunch right. of Micron P320Hs plugged in. Yeah, so we, we have the ability to do this, but he wasn't running the whole file system stack or SCSI or anything under it, right? He's, uh, correct. Yeah, he's just running the block IO against the raw devices. Yes. Yeah, so... Again, what we have to do, anybody here like to write to blo raw block devices from their application? Any application programmers? So database people used to write not through the file system to write to raw disk. It's become less popular, right? Most people do write the file systems today. A lot of people actually run their databases on NFS, which is potentially even slower. But some of the things Jens and other people have been working on is alleviating the I.O. bottlenecks in the stack. Um, what went into the kernels most recently was Jens's multi-queue I.O. Uh, work. It gives you, it takes a page out of the TCP and the networking communities uh, book. It allows us to have multiple queues for a single device, so you're not, you don't get blocked on, on the locks and acquiring locks and queuing and dequeuing. Um, I.O. scheduling, like I said, I mean, you really don't need to do I.O. scheduling. You don't have to think about, is it worth waiting to send down the I.O. because somebody else will come, because it's faster to send the I.O. down than to wait and see if anything else is coming. Usually the completion time is faster. You still don't uh, want something like CFQ. We don't have, at this time, a high-speed high, high uh, C group-based scheduling or anything for fairness. Yeah. So if you're doing, the comment from Kent is, if you, you need CFQ in things if you want to do C groups or, or kind of containers or bandwidth shaping for between apps. Yes. Yeah. Um, things we're also working on is getting affinity for I.O. requests, making sure you respond to the I.O. requests in the same CPU, just like you've done for other things networking. Um, and looking at general performance and kind of hygiene in the stack, uh, contention on locks, um, and, and so on. One of the issues you'll see, I mean, and again, as you move the uh, device drivers off to the side, you do lose some of the features that we actually coded up in SCSI. Some of these things actually make sense and are useful. If you think about things, um, uh, file systems have something called discard um, at the Linux level, which turn into unmap for SCSI or uh, trim commands, and that informs the target device that we're not using that space anymore. Well, if you're not using SCSI, you have to kind of make up your own variation on that. 
There's other things in the standard that, again, when you go out of the standards spec, you have to go back and reinvent or recode. So there is potentially extra work. So um, just a, a quick shortcut. You know, one of the things uh, we also have to contend with is as we get faster, there's also peeping, people making things that are bigger and slower. Individual SATA drives today are up to six terabytes, which is pretty big. I don't think you have that on your laptop, but you probably have this in the cloud in, in uh, big data farms. One of the technologies I'll give you a brief overview here is called Shingled Magnetic Recording, SMR. And it actually fundamentally changes the way that the drive manufacturers lay down data on the platters um, in an interesting way that really challenges how we do file systems. Um, with these capacities, even just a few drives, just 10 drives, you know, 10 plus 2 drives in a RAID 6 stripe, 60 terabytes of raw data, right, before we put a file system on it. That's a lot. It's bigger than ext3 or ext4 did until we got uh, through the 32-bit boundaries just a few years ago. Um, there is a lot of goodness in having a single file system. When we force users to break up a file into lots of little file systems, we're forcing the application to effectively doing space allocation between different pools, which is really inconvenient, right? If you're doing backup and you're putting your movies here and your videos here and your MP3s here and your, your user data here because you don't have enough space in one file system, you got to remember where you put it and keep track of it. Having a big file system is more convenient. So there is, in general, we want to try to make people be able to use a big file system if they want to so they don't have to do all the, the uh, bookkeeping to figure out where things went. Um, Trade-offs people know about. Anybody ever wait for FSCK more than a week? <laughs> yeah, not repair guys. If you wait a week, it's probably gone. You know, just give it up and go to your backup tapes. Um, we have made it a lot faster. Um, you know, but, but again, as you get larger and as you have more files in a file system, your repair time gets slower. Um, you also need, as you get a very large file system, you need a very large server with a lot of storage, uh, a lot of DRAM. You need to load the metadata in when you're doing a repair operation. Um, there's a, a Dave Chenner who works on FS, XFS said that there is one um, XFS user, not a Red Hat user because we didn't officially support, uh, I think it was a one petabyte XFS instance. To do an XFS repair, they needed like a terabyte of DRAM in a server. Fortunately for them, they had a box on the SAN that they could plug into to run the command, and then it was fine. Right. But again, sometimes, and, and we have worked on compressing the, the data footprint that you need for repair, by the way, because again, that we don't scale up that well, and a petabyte's not that big anymore. It sounds, sounds embarrassing. And updating lots of small metadata on the file system is hard as well. So how do we, this is a brief overview of persistent memory. So persistent memory is a very, in some way, this is going back to the 50s. Core memory was kind of persistent. If you think about IBM mainframes and core memory, if you turned it off and turned it back on again, your program would start executing from the same place. So just like that, you potentially have all the state that you had when you powered down. This is challenges that application people will have to deal with, operating systems have to deal with. I'm not going to focus on the general application things so much here. But you shouldn't rely anymore on the fact that your data space is blank when you power on a box. Because I know everybody always says, have you rebooted the box yet, right? You know, powered off, powered on again. Doesn't necessarily clear out the state in these devices. And that's, that's a major feature. These parts are byte addressable, which is, again is a challenge for the storage stack. We usually update things in file system blocks of 512 or 4K blocks or even bigger. And they are coming from multiple vendors, probably each with a different technology. And again, I can't really talk about um, vendors' parts. Uh, you know, you can talk to your favorite vendor about what their roadmaps are and ask them. But there are parts that have been around for years that just basically have their DRAM parts with like flash on the back. They scrape off half the, the DRAM parts, put flash and super caps and pro for power loss. So you can have things like this today. They look like DRAM, they fit in DRAM slots, and they'll, they'll run at DRAM speeds. And when you lose power on the right motherboard, it will save your data and come back again. It would be great to be able to have at least as few as possible new device drivers to drive these parts, but that's, that's a hard challenge. If you look at the PCI Express SSD card, originally every single vendor had pretty much their own driver. We have been converging on something called NVMe Express, 
So NVMe refers to the PCI Express cards. A lot of people call persistent memory non-volatile memory without the E, which is just for, to confuse everybody, right? So the working group uh, in the industry standards body is called the NVM, non-volatile memory working group. So don't get the two confused. NVMe is the stuff you have today with a new driver that a lot of people are moving to. NVM is the, the newer stuff that you don't have yet. So I mentioned this um, in passing just as a high-level goal. I think these parts get interesting, not necessarily just when you have the parts that you can get today that have the batteries and the super caps and, the, and they basically destage to flash. But when the newer technologies come out, kind of the new generation of these parts come out, they're going to be roughly the same capacity, same cost point, and same performance as DRAM. And you're going to be able to scale them by putting more, more of these parts in your DIMM slots. Right? You want to get more IOs per second, so each, each slot is basically DRAM speed, say a couple million IOs per slot, get 30 million IOs until you run out of CPU, until you can't talk to your storage anymore. Storage won't be your bottleneck, it'll be your CPU. The interesting thing here is that you also have to worry about, you still have worries with F-Sync and, and, and or M-Sync, because you have volatile state in your CPU caches as it goes through. If you're writing data in your application, your data cache will cache it for you. So just because it's byte addressable and you touched it doesn't mean it's going to persist over a power outage. So you still need to think about how to program it. But what it means to us as a community is two things. One is we have to figure out how to get the kernel to get out of your way so you can do millions of IOs per second. And two, as application developers and people who develop open source software, we have to give you an environment where your existing applications work as fast as possible. I'll talk a little bit about that today. In my opinion, that means keeping our existing stack and tuning it to be blazing fast. And for those of you who are really in for pain and love pain, um, they will be proposing new APIs kind of centered around MMAP and other things like that that you, you can program to, to get the, the stack out of your way entirely. I don't think most applications care that much that it's worth it. it. It's kind of like the people, anybody here write applications? Okay. How many of you use Odirect? One person. Yeah. You, you care. Yeah, you care about the new stuff we're going to inflict on you. Yeah, I, so the comment is you'd rather have a better MMAP. MMAP will probably be easier than Odirect, I think, but it's still going to be potentially a little tricky and confusing. Right, because it's, it's very sp specific to the type of storage you have, what it, what it means to, to use it for APIs. So again, I think that most times, to get people to move to a new programming APIs, a new way of thinking, is kind of like moving from single-threaded applications to multi-threaded applications. Most of the applications, some 20 years after we had SMP, are still single-threaded, I think. Can Maybe 10% are multi-threaded, and 1% are heavily multi-threaded in a really effective, high-performance way. Right. What, not, not counting Java. Can I ask something? Please, yeah. Um, on this side. The, yeah. Um, if persistent memory is there and the system shuts down, comes back up, then ECC goes out the window because there's no active state. If uh, a ray from space hits that memory and changes it, there's gonna be, it's going to be on the file system to figure out if something has changed in the midterm. Yeah, is that I, something that you're working on? So that would be a problem for the hardware people that I would blame the hardware people about. But I think, <laughs> but I think what, you would, what you would probably see in these parts is, again, you, you would probably oh, update a whole cache line at a time. I mean, there will be some, even though you're byte addressable, you won't really be updating it a byte at a time. You'll be updating a byte in your L1 or L2, L3 cache. It'll percolate out with a whole cache line as it goes down that, that food chain until it hits a persistence domain, which is these new parts. So again, you'll have some block block transactions, but it's hidden from you as an application programmer. Okay. What we'll do, by the way, I mean, and, and again, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, which is all right, but I think because people like that durability of your data, no one likes to write your data and have it go away on you, we'll probably have to spend a lot of effort making our existing stack with read and write system calls work really fast. So if I can give you read and write that does 8 million IOs per second, you'd probably be happy, even if you could get 12 million IOs per second if you used MMAP, right? If I get you two-thirds of the way there, I think you'd, most application people would be okay. You, you might need more. <laughs> yeah, but again, most applications, honestly, most applications don't actually wait on the IO devices today because we've, we've so painfully taught you not to wait for us. 
over decades. You know, you, you load into memory and you, have, you do everything you can not to talk to us ever again, right? So, so unless you're really IO bound, this stuff isn't gonna change your life. Firefox, you know, you know, Mozilla, you're not talking to the disk that much. There was a very brief period when, unfortunately, you were F-syncing every transaction, I think. <laughs> then you were waiting on the disk a whole lot. Yeah. But, but other than that, you know, it's, it's, it's fairly uncommon to have IO-bound applications, I think, for, for most users. So again, you know, I, I, I talked about this a little bit. Um, the way we think of things, and this is to your point about the ECC DRAM, Historically, you have two states. The state in DRAM is a state that we all know is going to go away, right? We scribble all over it, and occasionally, every good application programmer calls fsync or, or, or fdatasync to make it persist, right? If you don't call that, we as file system people don't really care about your data. We care about our metadata. So we do the same for our transactions. When we update inodes and block allocation maps and stuff, we make sure that we call the equivalent internally of syncs, you know, using transaction logic to flush it down to the disk. But your data could all go away and we're happy, as long as we know where it would be if you had done f-sync, right? And we do probably try to make f-sync in it and f-data sync work properly. Um, but this is kind of intrinsic in the stack, right? You have this two-state thing, you know, this, the uh, temporary state in DRAM and the durable state down here in another storage domain you know, usually over a block-oriented protocol. Um, <clears throat> and it's resilient over crashes and reboots. I'm sure nobody's ever lost data if they use f-sync or f-data-sync. Um, with these new parts, you still do need to use something like f-sync or an m-sync on the region that you persist, because again, it is, there are volatile places in the code, in the data path where you can lose data. But it does kind of break those boundaries. Um, you could potentially have a box with nothing but persistent DRAM. Um, you might have boxes with some regions that are DRAM and some that are persistent memory, and you might have flash, and you might have big fat drives further down the, down the uh, storage chain. So one of the things people are doing, um, the SNEA, uh, Storage Networking Industry Association, has been working on providing database models. There'll be some pointers to their spec here. Anybody who, is, who does care from the database community and everybody should actually review that spec, give them feedback on their mailing list, um, I don't think you have to be a member, but if you send me your comments, I'll, I'll find the person on my team who has to sit through their technical track working meetings and have him hound them for you. Right, we actually do, and that's something I would love to hear from everybody, look at these things. I'm not going to go through the spec here, but look at the spec as they propose it. It is heavily centered around um, in-mapped interfaces to let you do these applications. If that works for you, do let us know, okay? Um, and the first draft is open for review. It's been published. Well, the big takeaway here is persistent memory really wants to get all the I.O. path clean of file system code, storage code. They want you to poke at data and have it live. So can't be cache will be gone. It's history. You don't need it anymore. I think, I think this is a little bit of an easy assumption, right? Because you also, when you get all the code out, you can't do things like snapshotting. Right, backup applications which rely on snapshots and stuff. Your, your data is done out of, we don't intercept the data. We don't have a finger in the path, right? So we can't help you. You're on your own, right? So again, you might actually have two ways to approach these memory, one through the traditional path, and then you know, a time where you're running fast and loose without having the capabilities. As I mentioned, this isn't unfortunately the only device we have to deal with. So the storage industry is, would love to keep selling you spinning drives forever, right? The good news is they have this new model called shingled magnetic recording, and, and they came out to the Linux community first, actually, before they came out to other operating system vendors to say, this is what we're thinking of doing. Does it make any sense to you? Um, and effectively, what happens is the read heads have gotten smaller than the write heads on drives, so you can't write as finely as you can read, if that makes any sense at all. The write head's big and fat, the read head's little and skinny, so the write tracks are fat and overlay like shingles on your roof in a house um, data. Um, it does change your response time. It's actually even slower, potentially, than traditional drives, especially if you violate the rules.
how you do this, how the industry people have done this is they've carved up the drive surface into bands. Each drive vendor might have a different number of bands. Some of them allow you to do random writes, but most of the bands, the bands that get you the highest density and the most consistent performance, have to be written in a append-only mode. So you have to write from sector 0, sector 1, sector 2, sector 3, in that order, and you can never go backwards until you get rid of the whole band. You can recycle a whole band at once. This is a problem for us, right? Again, transactional databases, you typically like to overwrite in place. File systems, we could probably allocate in sequential order pretty easily, but we keep track of things in metadata. Caching layers, you typically have some kind of metadata somewhere to, that lets you track where things go, and that's updated in place. So a little bit more here. Um, I'll let you look at this. So. What have they done? Um, they actually have three implementations. Many of us actually have SMR drives actually sitting in our, our laptops and video recorders today. If you have a TiVo, Seagate shipped millions of drives to the video industry already. And they high hid it from us with, with basically a flash translation layer like thing for SMR, which says, we'll put enough CPU and memory down in the box in the, in the drive so that we can hide these commands from you, pretend it doesn't exist. The downside is it makes the drives relatively expensive. Most of that cost comes through to us as consumers. And also, if you violate the rules, you get really bad performance. I mean, it has to do really horrible things under the covers. The good news is everything just works, except for occasionally you stop while the drive goes out and tries to think for a minute or so about how to recover. The next thing we can do um, anybody here have a 4K drive in your laptop? You all do. <laughs> yeah. Anybody who has a laptop newer than two or three years has, you can't really write 512 bytes to your laptop drives. Um, they're all 4K. And what we did with 4K sector drives, they pretend to be 512 bytes, but we work really hard in the storage stack in Linux to never send down anything but a properly aligned 4K I.O. So we make it work for you, even though you don't know about the rules. Well, shingled magnetic recording people can do the same thing. They're going to tell us about the bands, but they're going to allow us to do the IOs, even if we don't follow the rules. So if you do decide to overwrite in place, they may punish you, right? It'll be really slow, it'll be painful, but it'll work, and your, your data will survive. Um, but they'll show us what the rules are, they'll show us what the bands are, and where your write pointers are, so that you'll know what you should do. Um, this will work unmodified with Linux today, with file systems, device mapper, bcache, whatever. Um, but it won't work as well as it could. The holy grail of the drive industry is to take all the hardware they can out of the drive to make it as cheap as possible and put all the pain back in the operating system. Um, this is called restricted drive mode. And what this means is if you violate the rules, if you wrote sector 0, 1, 2, 3, and then go back to write sector 2, I just reject the I.O. flat out. It fails. That's more painful and a little bit more difficult. So we're actually looking at, could we possibly do this with existing file systems? They have had, had some success using um, tape file system libraries. There's an IBM file system library that, I forgot what it's called, Lin, Lin tape FS, Lin FS. Pardon? LTFS. Yes. Yeah, so it does work with that. Right? But it does have, um, some of these things do have a look aside device which keeps your meta metadata on the side. Oh, went backwards. But the other kind of, my takeaway from this is at the same time the persistent memory vendors are talking to us about taking code out of the IO path, the hard disk drive vendors are talking about us, can you guys put a lot more code in the IO path and hide this from us? So this is a great example this year of people pushing us from both directions at once. So what are we doing about it? Um, number one, your PCI Express cards. I mean, the, I mentioned in passing the NVMe Express driver. Anybody here have a new driver, a new card with the NVMe Express? I think Micron is moving to it, some other vendors. The good news is you won't need to use, for a lot of the very high speed current technology PCI Express cards, an out of the box binary driver anymore. You'll get very high speed out of some of your, your open source kernels can support. And as Red Hat, I can say we really like to be able to help you when your code breaks, so we prefer open source drivers whenever they, whenever they work. Um, 
Like I said, I, my assumption is that people are going to be very slow to move in the application space to these new programming models. So we need to work hard to get the stack to just work. Um, and the first step there is really to get a basically a fake block device. So we're going to take these really cool, exciting, sexy parts and make them look like a drive. Right? This is kind of boring and kind of tedious, but it does mean that we can put device mapper, B cache, uh, XFS, ext4, all on top of them, have them work normally for you, and they'll be pretty fast right, when they're properly tuned. We have a couple of prototype block drivers today. Um, uh, Jeff Moyer has been working on one at Red Hat, and um, I asked Jeff to do some performance modeling for, for me on his driver, and he said, it's still too bad. <laughs> it's not worth steering yet. <laughs> but we will get faster, right? I mean, this is actually a common thing from a lot of the part vendors that we've talked to, the people making these parts. They really want to get out to the market really soon. They don't want to wait on new storage stacks and new technologies. And to do that, you need to have something that hides it from you, right? So that's what this block driver will do. I mentioned um, Jens's uh, multi queue block uh, work. It landed in 3.13. You do have to opt into that with your device driver. The NVMe Express driver, I think, has been modified to opt into multi queue. I don't think too many other drivers have yet. So you won't take advantage of that uh, normally right away. One thing we will be doing, I think, with SMR uh, and with persistent memory is you're unlikely to be able to afford enough persistent memory to need just that in a server. So you'll probably end up with tiers of storage. So I think you're going to see more tiering. The device mapper community has something called DM cache. Kent has been working on bcache for a few years now, a while. You could actually end up with DRAM. You know, you could have like, I don't know, eight deep caches, right? Your L1, L2, L3 cache. You could have persistent memory, uh, you know, DRAM, persistent memory, flash, and then big fat SATA drives, right? And we don't expect users to have to manage it, but we have to figure out if and how many of these combinations make sense. I can also see things if you have just a laptop or just a very thin client um, where persistent memory might be the only thing you have in your whole system, right? And those would be really fast, but not very big in capacity. I promised Kent to uh, put his, his, is that still the right URL for you, Kent? Good. Yeah. So this is a project that um, is upstream along with DM cache. Um, FS cache is a caching layer that can take another partition and cache for NFS clients. I think the Ceph community has also ported in support for FS cache. Um, and there's a lot of vendor specific caches. If you talk to any high end storage vendor, a lot of them have SSD cards in your servers these days that do caching at the block layer automatically for you. I mentioned some of you will be crazy enough to use these new applications, <laughs> programming ideas. And I do think it'll be mostly the, the high-end databases. There'll be open source libraries that we should focus on. I think most applications will get fast enough that it won't be worth worrying about this too much. But we're very definitely interested in talking to those of you who need speed. Come find us. Um, like I said, the first two modes of SMR just work. For the host aware mode, the one in the middle, there are tunings that we don't pay attention to, um, mainly because the drive vendors haven't actually finalized what they're going to give us yet. So um, we're, we're negotiating with them what they are. We're working with prototypes from several vendors. Good news is the vendors are all working roughly collaboratively on the spec, and they have some parts that we've been able to, 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 to look at and test. Um, Ted Cho recently, um, if you follow ext4 development, has posted some thoughts and some projects on how to make ext4 aware and work with SMR drives, at least for the host aware, if not for the restricted mode. Um, Dave Chinner told me, of course, as Dave would, I can do that with XFS. It might take a year or two. Um, but, but again, XFS has had real-time volumes forever, uh, which are effectively used today in a lot of video recording apps, right? because they effectively do sequential writes for you. So if you have two partitions, it's much easier to imagine keeping your metadata and your copy, in, copy update in place stuff in the random write-enabled device and keeping your sequentially allocated copy on write stuff on, a, on the uh, very high-density, larger SMR drive. 
I think it's easy, but I don't have to do it. I'm a manager. I just point. Yeah. Uh, the other thing we've been talking about, and this is kind of a follow-on to the SMR work, is today in Linux, and it's also a limitation in Windows, the size of a block device can't exceed the size of the virtual memory page size, which today is, is only 4K, um, which is pretty tiny. The drive vendors, when they did the 4K sectors, actually wanted to do 16K. They talked to us actually back it was been, it's been almost 10 years ago. They talked to, to me and, and they talked to people from the Windows development team. They said, that'd be great, except it just won't work. <laughs> we, won't, we won't let you do any I.O. at that scale. We're talking about it again. Hopefully, we're going to talk about it at LSF at a, a Linux Foundation event in late March, I think. It's on our agenda. Um, some people are fairly skeptical that it's possible with the memory management system. Other people were more optimistic. Um, I think it's time to, to try to, to poke at it and see if we can break that boundary. It would be nice, and some of these technologies will, in fact, have 32K, 64K sectors. In fact, a lot of storage devices have had these very large sector sizes of 64K or 128K for, for more than a decade, but they just hide it from you. So if we can figure out what those sizes are, we'll be more efficient and get better performance, maybe make storage a little bit less expensive to consume, which is a good thing. Um, LWN actually covered this uh, 4K limit debate today. I, I always tell my wife, when I make LWN and John Corbett writes anything that I, that I help poke, I'm, I'm proud. And she reassures me that no one cares. <laughs> yeah. So um, happy to take more questions. And I, I will do my shout out to, to John and the, L, the folks at LWN.net. They cover a lot of this stuff in very good detail and go into a lot of technical depth. Uh, this is where the uh, SNEO working group is. That's the one that's looking at the application, kind of the programming model. Um, I hope you're rubbing your face, not, be, not because you're looking at this back and saying, oh my god, it'll never work. <laughs> right? But it is, it is worth checking out and giving them feedback. Um, there are lots of places where we're hopefully going to be discussing this and debating it. I think LinuxCon and Plumbers will both be back in Europe this year. Um, plumbers, for the first time ever, Linux Plumbers is not as big as FOSDEM by, by, I don't know, not an order of magnitude, but it's six or 700 people. It'll be next to LinuxCon in Dusseldorf uh, this, this autumn. So happy to take questions. Thank you. Ah, there. I'm going to ask you a question that's a bit, a bit unfair, perhaps. But um, first comment was on the terabyte RAM systems. I, I manage uh, one of them, the more on the terabyte RAM. And you'll know this, the first thing, if you ever get one, is to tune the VM dirty uh, ratio down really low. Because if you don't do that, what happens? Yeah, so, so, so the question's around, when you have a terabyte of RAM today, it doesn't always work magically smoothly as you'd hope. Because the dirty page ratio keeps things in, and then it does these really bursty things. Yeah. You know, so, so it is actually... <laughs> There are things you have to do in the memory management system to scale up to multiple terabytes of, of storage of, of DRAM. Um, if you had only persistent memory, there would be no write back. No, no the problem is that you, you write a 50 gigabyte file and it'll sit in RAM forever. It'll be cached forever. And if you lose your power, you've lost your data. <laughs> yeah. you power. But um, yeah. my question really is to turn this on its head. We, we've, got, we've got requirements these days for big data, graph analysis, Hadoop, all these things. Can we see using these solid state things as an extension to RAM rather than storage? Yeah, so Comet is using these solid state things instead of RAM. So a lot of vendors have talked in public. And, and so again, there's some things I can talk about. I, I know the Fusion IO people have talked in public about making their current generation PCAI Express cards look like RAM, right? They'll put enough DRAM buffering and whatever magic pixie dust in the middle in firmware to let you see virtually a very large DRAM space and page in and out. Right, so you wouldn't have to do I.O. to storage, but it looks like virtually big RAM. And that's a very reasonable application right, for, for in-memory databases in, in huge sizes. Because again, talking to storage, again, is painfully slow. Right? You know, if you have to talk to SATA drives or, or Flash. So what you just said actually sounds kind of like an old-fashioned mainframe model where you have single-level memory addressing your entire database. But you need an API where you can control like, all the APIs we have now are about the file system, not about controlling memory. Um, the other thing is, I worry if you're controlling it through memory and you're depending on the persistent memory, that means if this hardware, if, you're, if your 
um, CPU or memory or motherboard or whatever breaks, you can't just fail over to another machine attached to the same storage because now you're depending on... Uh, so you're, you're touching on two, two really good points, right? So, so again, um, one of the disadvantages of getting the file system and I.O. stack out of the code path is if you're using something like DRDB, DRBD to replicate your block state or or in Gluster or Ceph where you can replicate storage by, by grabbing file operations and splitting them between two nodes. We don't have that footprint. You can't, you can't necessarily, you can't necessarily plug the, the DRAM parts into another server and see what's on your storage. You might be able to move them though. They are durable, right? So you would have to take them out. I don't know if you can plug in PCI Express parts to your, I don't know. It's be interesting. I mean, the state is durable, so you would be able to take them out physically and put them into another machine, I think. But that's speculation on my part. Any more questions? No one threw anything. I'm, I'm quite happy. Yeah. It's a challenge question. Uh, it's not really a question, but it's regarding security consideration because today it's uh, memory is supposed to be lost once you lose the power and storage is supposed not to be lost. But once you have something hybrid like this, it means uh, uh, developers don't have to consider only new API but uh, uh, also security uh, issue because uh, passphrase or uh, uh, anything that is related to encryption, for example, yeah. Uh, it's not only you have, you have to take care that it is really lost uh, once you shut down the box. Yeah, that's an excellent comment. So again, the security community, if you think that just keeping things in DRAM uh, allows you to, to not have to clean up after you shut down and reboot, that, that assumption is not a good assumption anymore. I mean, those things will still be potentially out there waiting for someone to hack at and discover. But uh, scrubbing is your friend, right? And we'll, we'll have to figure out what regions of these things need to be zeroed, right? Though you have to zero out a lot of stuff. Um, on the positive side, do you uh, can you expand on what this might mean for applications? So what benefits applications might have if they can assume persistent memory that is as fast as main memory? So for example, regarding the kind of failure handling they do, restarts and so on? Yeah, so um, question about it. What application benefits? Number one benefit is you will never ever wait on storage again, right? I think you'll be waiting on CPU. If you have a fully provisioned box with these parts, we won't be your bottleneck. You always get to pick your bottleneck when you design a system, and it won't be storage at the highest in systems. So that's the highest thing. Um, you would be able to also potentially do suspend and resume in a more reliable way, I assume. But that's, again, um, that, those are kind of the easy ones that jump to mind. But this is mainly about speed, I think, speed and performance. There's other models that will be interesting. You might be able to reduce cost in servers. Um, if you think about hardware RAID cards, if you have these persistent memory, even in the quantities you have today, you could get rid of the, the non-volatile memory that you have in your RAID cards and do this with software RAID. So there's some cost of ownership issues, some performance issues, probably faster starting and shutting down. A good question. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the roadmap of uh, this technology? Uh, are there uh, kind of prototypes uh, available to selected developers like you? Or are you just testing uh, against uh, software emulators? Yeah, so I, so I can never tell you about parts that were given to me under, you know, an NDA. Um, there are parts on the market today, and I've been encouraging um, the people who provide them to actually talk about them. Again, these are the parts that are basically DRAM with battery-backed destaging to cache. Um, and you can actually go back, you know, decades back to core memory, right? Core memory is effectively the earliest persistent memory class. So it's things that people have dealt with decades ago. Um, there are parts there today. People are looking at this. Um, but I can't talk about stuff. You can Google around and see what people who aren't under NDA talk about in the press. Fortunately, sorry. Okay, let's thank our speaker again. Yeah.